Thank you, Charles. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome to the ones who just joined to our conference, New Diversity Shifting Paradigms in Mental Health. Um, this conference is being organized by ADHD Ireland Autistic Doctors International um, Institute of Neurodiversity, ION, and UI uh, Main Youth, UCD, and Untap Talent. And so since last year's conference, a lot in May 22, a lot has happened. Uh, the new diversity movement, for instance, great, um, great momentum and will likely to continue to gain even more so. Um, a lot of people sharing their lift experiences, being professionals from all, really all ways of life, um, even up to executives and leaders and all really just having one common goal, which is new inclusion and a new affirmative approach to every, every aspect of social, public and private life, really. Um, but then at the same time, the world slowly began to move out of COVID. And what remained is the tremendous strain on people's mental health. And while I feel that efforts have been made to remove stigma, around mental health issues, um, there is an opportunity and a need to educate um, and help further. And such an opportunity is today's um, panel about new diversity in mental health in the workplace. So my name is Sylvan Ruthenberg. I'm an executive coach and consultant, and I'm neurodivergent myself. Um, I identify both as um, have being ADHD and autistic. Um, I'm very excited to welcome today's panelists, which are James Cusack, who is the chief executive of, of Autistica, um, Jay Davis, uh, research assistant at the Center for Research at Autism and Education at UCL, University Col a College of a London, um, Angarad Davis, who just had we some of you may have seen in the um section before who is the clinical operations director for rtn mental health and then mary Doherty, who is a consultant and anesthetist at our ladies hospital in evan and the founder of autistic doctors international um so before we dive into the questions i'd like to have the panelists the opportunity to um introduce and present themselves so james maybe you would like to start um hi everyone uh, i uh, spoke earlier i'm james cusack i'm the chief executive um of autistica which is the uk's leading autism research and campaigning uh, charity and i'm also autistic uh, myself uh. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Mary Doherty. I am, I'm a founder of Autistic Doctors International. I'm uh, autistic, I'm a, an anaesthetist, parent of two neurodivergent kids. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it for now. Um, I'll go next. Hi everybody, I am Jade Davis and I'm a research assistant at the Centre for Research in Autism and Education, which is based at UCL. And most of the research that I've done over the past kind of four years has sort of been focusing on employment. Hi everyone, my name is Anne Harrod. You've just all um, heard from me a minute ago, but I'm the Clinical Ops Director of RTM Mental Health Solutions, who is a um, diagnostic service. Lovely, thank you so, so much, everyone. So I'd love to start out with the first question to James. Um, and I would just like to hear more about your work at Autistica and specifically your research about uh, in and around autistic adults. Great, thank you very much. So, um, like I said, autistic is a, a, a research charity which tries to ensure that we're supporting funding research which are based on community priorities. We've got six 2030 goals which are, are based on that. 
specifically on autistic adults, we've got a, a quite a diverse range of projects. So there's one project which we're really excited about, which is looking at the effectiveness of annual health checks for um, autistic adults. We know that tragically autistic people face real health inequalities, which also has a knock-on effect on life expectancy. We're really hoping that this health check um, can really play a role in be beginning to address those inequalities. We fund our studies on things like autism and anxiety. So trials which are looking at the effectiveness of different types of psychotherapies. A key role that autistic plays is in catalyzing autism research so we've really helped to get trials off the ground like trials testing the effectiveness of medications like sertraline on uh, treatment of anxiety which we know is used frequently in the general population but we don't know how effective it is for autistic adults we're looking at how we can reimagine the assessment for autistic adults looking at the effectiveness of things like strength and needs assessment and working alongside researchers like Jay who's on the panel we've been looking at initiatives and um, on autism and employment and different approaches which we can use there, which I talked about um, earlier. Thank you so, so much, James. Um, so my next question would be to Jade. And I was wondering, what are some common mistakes that are made when companies try to adjust the hiring process, process to be more neuroinclusive? Yeah, that's a really good question. How long have you got? <laughs> um, I think the first mistake is obviously not trying or at least not appearing to try. Um, I think when it comes to the hiring process, there's so much that we can do that would help everybody. Um, and so I would always personally recommend sort of trying to make these adjustments. I think the most common kinds of mistakes are things like not providing enough information in advance. Um, so I think most people will have heard it's typically quite useful to give questions in advance, but actually more broadly. So if there is an interview, who's going to be there? What do they look like? Um, what are their roles and how would you work with them if you did have the job? What does the interview room look like? Just really giving all the kind of information that you can in advance. Um, I think before interviews, there's lots of issues in terms of jargon and job descriptions and really focusing on skills that might not be central to the role. Um, so lots of job descriptions include um, things about teamwork and general kind of socialization. For some roles, that's really important and we need to keep that in. But I think sometimes where the, where the job doesn't require that, we don't need that in the job description. And sort of more broadly, this reliance on traditional interviews, I don't think it's going anywhere, unfortunately, but we do know that, um, particularly for autistic people in my research, um, lots of autistic people tend to prefer those kind of more practical um, sort of work trials where, where they can showcase their skills. Um, and then the kind of final thing that I, I would say in, in terms of mistakes is just a lack of knowledge and understanding. And I think that underpins everything um, when, when it comes to employment. Um, I think people that don't know, don't know how to change. And so I think that's always where we want to start. Thank you so, so much, Jade. Um, very interesting, very practical tips, I feel as well. Um, so my next question would be to Mary. So uh, you founded Autistic Doctors International in 2019, um, and I would just really love to hear more about it, um, just generally, and maybe some specific research you have been working on. Sure, thanks. Yeah, for anyone that's not familiar with it, um, we founded in uh, 1st of April 2019, uh, not deliberately so, but it just happened that way. And we started with seven members and we grew out of um, an organization for neuro doc neurodivergent doctors more widely um, because we felt that we needed a, a space for ourselves as autistic doctors. Um, and yeah, as I said, we started with seven and here we are just over four years later where we have almost 800 um, and that's 800 doctors across all specialties, all grades, right across the world. Um, mo most people are based in the UK, um, about 60%, I think, based in the UK. But we do have members in every continent, except, I think, Antarctica. And we also have an associated group uh, for autistic med students. And I think at this point, there's about 200 in that group. 
So we started out as a peer support um, peer support group. Uh, we moved into advocacy and then subsequently moved into education, research, training. Um, and yeah, we have quite a strong research re research group at this point. Um, and that's a, a lot of that is down to our research lead, Dr. Sebastian Shaw, who's based at Brighton and Sussex Medical School. Um, and uh, we focus on two aspects that, that are linked. The first is healthcare for the autistic community much more widely, and then also the needs of our own members. So autistic doctors, autistic healthcare providers, um, autistic medical students. Um, so we've got quite a, quite a few research projects around, um, around those aspects at the moment. And I think probably what's most um, upsetting really at the moment is a paper that we have in review currently, which is looking at the experiences of our own members. And the mental health aspects, uh, the mental health, you know, results are just really, really worrying. Um, much, much higher rates of um, mental distress, suicidality, suicidal ideation, previous suicide attempts. Um, really worryingly, much, much higher, I think, than um, doctors in general, and certainly much higher than in the general population. Um, so that's one of the aspects that we're really um, concerned about. Um, we're concerned about just areas around disclosure, particularly. That's a big issue for a lot of our members. Um, very, you know, most of our members do not disclose, um, which leads to, you know, masking. You know, really having to expend so much energy in the workplace, just just masking our autistic traits and trying to present as, you know, neurotypical, non-autistic. Um, it's just so much easier when when it's possible to. Um, you know, to just come out at work and just be openly, openly autistic, openly neurodivergent. Um, that makes life li life a lot easier. But there are huge barriers to disclosure because disclosure is not safe for a lot of our members. I mean, we've had several members um, ejected from training, training roles, um, literally, you know, removed from training programs, just having disclosed a diagnosis of autism um, on the basis that, you know, this myth that being autistic is incompatible with, you know, with a professional career in medicine. It's absolutely not. Um, so uh, healthcare for the autistic community is another big area of, of, of interest and research for us. And we've actually just published a paper recently looking at reasonable adjustments uh, for autistic people in healthcare. Um, and that paper is open access. Uh, it's, it's autistic space, a novel framework for meeting the needs of autistic people in healthcare settings. And the thing is, um, that framework, I think, is not just relevant to healthcare. It is applicable much more widely, I think. So in several settings, we're looking at adapting that framework in both in education and in, uh, in, in employment. So I'm hoping that that will, that will be helpful because people find autism a bit hard to understand and people want to make adjustments and people want to meet our needs but sometimes don't quite know where to start so we're hoping that this will be a really simple um memorable framework it's you know space it stands for sensory needs predictability acceptance communication and empathy and then we describe three other domains where the principles apply and that's physical space processing space and emotional space and i see the the link to the papers in the chat there so it's, it's open access so i would recommend that people have a look at that and hopefully you may find it helpful thank you so so much for sharing mary um i'm Amazed about the work you do and shocked about the details you just shared, which are more than worrying, really. Um, so I hope that that is specific for that novel framework um, might be of help for a lot of people, um, maybe not only in healthcare settings, but equally for the workplace settings as well. Um, so moving over to Angarat, my first question who you would be that you work at RTN, RTN Mental Health Solutions, which is a mental health care provider, a mental health service provider for uh, individuals largely. Um, and I was wondering, what are some of the most recent trends that you have identified with regards to um, ASD and ADHD assessment specifically? Yeah, so some interesting things that we started to pull apart as we started to run some kind of um, internal research with regards to um, our comorbidities and what we see when we do our diagnostic assessment. So we send out a series of pre-screening questionnaires 
Now, these aren't diagnostic tools, but it helps us give a clearer picture as to all the different aspects of an individual's life. So we're looking at the moment about the, um, the link between alexithymia and ASD. Now, that's a very common one at the moment, and it's quite interesting how many people do score highly with alexithymia and ASD. Also, things with regards to mental health, obviously, as I spoke about in my presentation, that there is a huge link there with regards to mental health and um, neurodiverse, uh, neurodiversity, um, neurodivergent, sorry. And I think that's something that we're also looking at at the moment is whether people's anxiety is um, elevated more prior or after diagnosis. We speak in, I've spoken a lot about the kind of grief cycle that someone can go through, but also we want to look at that as a longevity and see kind of how that can, how the diagnostic process itself can actually impact someone's um, anxiety levels. That's one thing that we're specifically looking at the moment within RTM. Thank you so, so much for sharing, Ingrid. Um, very, very interesting indeed. Um, which is also a good um, introduction for my next question to James, which is um, one of your research focus areas is uh, anxiety and how it affects um, autistic adults or autistic individuals in general. And I would love to uh, understand a bit more about it. Yeah, so I mean, one of the exciting things about well, understanding anxiety and autism is that we actually are beginning to understand quite a lot about it. I mean, unfortunately, anxiety is very prevalent um, in autistic children and that extends through. And so as it is, so by um, mid-childhood, we expect about half of autistic children to be experiencing some sort of issue relating to anxiety, and which is a real serious problem. But we know a lot of the reasons why that exists. So um, we know, as you know, as was just said, that alexithymia is a big issue in relation to, in relation to um, anxiety, but also issues around sensory processing and uncertainty as well. And one of the things that we're beginning to do is test the effectiveness of different approaches and trying to personalise those approaches, you know, both in children and in autistic adults. A key thing that we would say, we've got a goal around improving supports for autistic people by 2030, is that we, what we need to get better at understanding with anxiety is that if you get an autism diagnosis, that means that you're quite likely to go on to experience anxiety. If this was in our area of healthcare, we'd be looking at preventative approaches. And so what I, I am really passionate about is us trying to find ways to prevent anxiety before it arises in autism. So looking at things like the environment, trying to understand for this person, how we stop this from getting to the stage where they actually need quite um, responsive support and move to a situation where we have prior to support. That will then also reduce the number of people who end up in acute settings as a consequence of experiencing those sorts of issues. So I think there's a huge, a huge um, amount that we can do to to, um, to prevent those issues. I, I'm really passionate about it. Finding ways to do so. Thank you so so much uh, for sharing, James. Um, and I'm hopeful that. Um, there will be a lot of good findings and help for um, people or just being able really to prevent um, people getting anxiety attacks. <clears throat> so um, we've been speaking about uh, workplace adjustments as well earlier. So Jade, I was wondering whether you can share some more of your uh, research finding in regards to workplace adjustment for neurodivergence. Yeah, of course. So for anybody who um, sort of isn't familiar with our research, um, we a few years ago, we did a sort of big survey that asked lots of different um, questions on topics that autistic people thought were important when it came to employment. And one of those was on adjustments. Um, and this is a published paper. I'm very happy to link it. It's open access if anybody wants to read the full paper. But essentially, we surveyed about 200 autistic people and ask them some questions about their experiences of both requesting adjustments, but also receiving adjustments. Really interestingly, most of the autistic people that we spoke to um, said that they thought adjustments were important. Um, fewer had actually requested adjustments. I think it was just over half had actually requested them. Um, and I think one of the big reasons for that is that people spoke about this onus being on autistic people, 
um, to do a lot of the legwork when it comes to adjustment. So they had to um, identify a need for an adjustment. They then had to identify the specific adjustment that would be useful for them. And then they had to take all of that information to their employer and make a case for why this was reasonable and why they needed the adjustment and what benefit it would have both for them, but also for the organisation. And also really um, sort of explain to the employer that it's not going to have negative impacts on, on other people. So you can imagine that is a huge process for people to undertake. And I think for some people, it's just something that they didn't want to do. We then sort of categorised the different adjustments that people spoke about either wanting or requesting. And so we categorised them into um, sort of changes to the job role. And that was things like changes to working hours, flexible working, those kinds of things. Um, there was changes to the physical environment. So that was things like um, being able to use noise cancelling headphones. And then there was these sort of, we called them changes to social and cultural practices. And those were things like changing the way that people communicate um, within the office. Um, in terms of the success of those adjustments, uh, changes to the job role typically were mostly successful. Um, changes to the physical environment and to social and cultural practices were more mixed in terms of their success. And it's hard to say why. We didn't specifically ask why these adjustments weren't successful. Um, it could be that these adjustments were implemented and in the end weren't successful. I think it's probably more likely that something's gone wrong in the implementation of these adjustments. And so a lot of people did speak about the fact that adjustments are often implemented quite well at first, maybe in the first week, the first month, and then over time, um, it slowly tapers off and then that it takes you back to square one. And it's a very hard conversation to have to say, I had this adjustment, it was working, it's gone, I need it back. And I think, um, yeah, so I think there are successes, um, but I think we need to think broadly in terms of how we implement them and make sure that they are consistently being implemented. And I did see a, a, something in the chat earlier about somebody saying that adjustments, um, it, A, they're not one size fits all, which I completely agree with, but also within an individual, you know, what you need one day, you might not need the next day. And I think having that open conversation and being able to review what's working and what's not, I think that, um, yeah, that, that would be really helpful. Thank you so, so much, Jade. Um, I feel that is some information that a lot of um, autistic or neurodivergent employees um, can relate to um, on a wide basis. Um, another area that is um, in needing for change would be healthcare. Um, and so Mary, I was wondering, why is it so important to have a more neuroaffirmative approach in healthcare? Um, I know I could answer that question quite easily, but um, please do go ahead. Um. Well, I think, I mean, really, I mean, the, the, the healthcare outcomes for autistic people are just awful. You know, and we have to, we absolutely have to tackle that. I mean, and it's not just the mental health issues. You know, we, we all know the suicide rates for autistic people are, you know, so much higher than general population, but also general health care outcomes. You know, I mean, cancer mortality is increased. Mortality from cardiovascular conditions are increased. You know, um, people tend to, forget, we, we all tend to forget about the, the brain body connections and how, um, you know, physical health care, because the barriers to health care are really significant. It's really difficult for autistic people to access health care in a lot of ways. But I think the health care outcomes may well be related to more than just that. There may well be physical conditions, you know, associated with being neurodivergent, which we'll hear about tomorrow. Um, you know, and I think it's really important that we recognize that, but we have to make access to health care um, so much easier, so much more um, autism friendly. You know, really, even the simple, the simplest things like difficulty using the telephone, for example, it's, you know, that was the number one barrier to healthcare in the survey that we did last year um, for autistic people. And so much of our healthcare services um, just rely on telephone contact for even making appointments or rearranging appointments and um, things like that. But as well as that, it's the lack of knowledge um, 
about autism amongst our, uh, our our professional peers because there's very little training. You know, there's um, I don't remember ever having any training on autism. Um, now th that is changing for sure. You know, and it's a lot it's a lot better now than it was. Um, but we still really need to roll out um, you know aut autism training for all healthcare providers. I think. Thank you so, so much, Mary. Um, I can very strongly re relate to it, as I said earlier as well. Um, I have been unfortunate enough to have him go to the ER a few times. Um, and I think most people will remember the question of, on a level of from one to 10, what is your pain? Um, what most people don't know is that is, this is called, I think, a visual pain score. So people look at you and compare the number with how you look in terms of how your face looks. Um, and I'm, for instance, a person, I can have a 10 out of 10 pain and I would still smile at you. So that will be very tricky. And even though I say that I'm autistic, it will still not really influence anything. So yeah, yeah I, I can. Mm, that's, a, that's, that, that's a really big issue for autistic people, you know, and doctors and, you know, healthcare providers just need to understand that, that, you know, because as, as healthcare providers, we're trained to assess somebody's pain based on how they present and based on the nonverbal signs of pain, you know, and that isn't, that, that isn't the same for us as autistic people. So I think it's really important, you know, that we, that, you know, that we do provide that training so that people can listen to people's words and believe them because there's that sense of epistemic injustice where by you know the words that we say we're not taken seriously um and commonly we have really bad outcomes because of that you know i mean um and people avoid then accessing healthcare when needed so commonly people turn up at emergency departments um, much later in the natural course of nat natural you know course of an illness um than non-autistic people might do and that's evidenced by the fact that autistic people are like um up to three times more likely to need to be admitted uh, to hospital once they do present and really worryingly over twice as likely to die as inpatients following pre presentation to an emergency department you know so it's really important I think that um, particularly emergency department staff get this training and I'm really hoping that we can roll out the autistic space framework um, so that, that provides an easy way for people to to, to access um, the, the training. Absolutely thank you so so much for sharing Mary, Mary. Um, and I hope yeah this will take off soon um and improve because i i very much agree as it's, at least the er stuff needs to have that training asap um when we speak about outcomes anger at um given the sharp rise in requests or just general awareness in around adhd and asd assessments how can we improve diagnostic and assessment outcomes specifically for adults um because there's a lot of research being done for children but um I feel there's still a lot missing in around adults. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. I think, obviously, thinking back about my presentation as well, well at the moment, there's so much research around um, children's assessments and diagnostic process. However, obviously, we see, on average, we see double the amount of individuals who are adults in comparison to children come through a diagnostic process. I think when we're thinking about improvement, I think there is a big he thing here about focusing on the diagnostic process itself and thinking about whether we can make it more strength focused instead of being very much focused on kind of challenges that individuals face obviously thinking about the diagnostic criteria yes we have to acknowledge some um, traits and symptoms but I also think that there's a gap here where we could start to acknowledge the strength uh, strength of individuals and actually create a diagnostic process that looks very much at the strength um, strength aspect. So I think if you ask me with regards to how we can improve that diagnostic process, that would be something I'd also be looking at. But I also think that with regards to improving it, it's making sure that the diagnostic um, is more well-rounded in the sense that obviously research has shown that there is so many comorbidities with regards to different diagnosis that actually when we're doing a diagnostic process, we need to be screening for other comorbidities. Now the screening tool isn't a, diagnos a diagnosis itself. However, but screening by it, we could be encouraging people to look for another diagnosis to better understand some of the traits and some of the symptoms that they may be experiencing. So I think the two things I'd be saying is actually a strength-based assessment, which is also looking at comorbidities would be improving the diagnostic outcomes um, and assessments for adults. Thank you so, so much, Angarit. Um, 
So when we speak about um, reviewing data and material, um, James, you are leading the Buckland Review on Autism, which is a UK, -le a, well, government-led UK initiative. Um, can you share a bit more about it, please? Sure. So I talked about this a, a bit earlier during my talk, so I'll try and keep it quite brief. So this is a review led by Sir Robert Buckland, um, who's a member of Parliament in, in the United Kingdom. Um, his review is on autism and employment. It's a review which is supported by Autistica and the Department for Work and Pensions. It's going to consider how employers can support autistic people already at work, how we can prepare and effectively begin to support autistic people into work, and how we can help to reduce um, stigma and, um, for autistic people and help autistic people to feel more uh, well and productive in the workplace. Um, we've been hosting a series of roundtables. There's some really key emerging trends. So first of all, I think there's a huge amount of work to prove attitudes and understanding of employers. We're not in the same position that we are with other diversity-based issues, so issues like around um, gender and, and to some extent race, but I think the issues is, is well understood, but it's sort of, there's more issues around intent to take action and action itself. We need, we've got a lot of work to improve um, and put that uh, awareness and understanding of employers. Um, I think employers need support in terms of being able to implement evidence-based changes, and that's why Autistic is working on creating a new diversity um, index, which can help us to ensure that um, employers can make evidence-based, sustainable, practical changes. And then finally, um, we see real evidence that we need to support autistic people to get into work. They're not, uh, you know, we are not as autistic people necessarily having access to the same privileges. And when you are autistic, like myself that getting into work has generally required to some extent a great degree of luck and support and uh, privilege as well. So um, I'm really conscious of that and, and conscious of the fact that we need to be supporting autistic people in, in, in that way as well. So those are the emerging trends from that review. I think it's a really exciting piece of work, something that I'm really passionate about. And I believe, although it's not going to be the complete panacea um, to doing what we hope to do, which is to help to double the rate of employment for autistic people, I believe it's an important step in our, in our journey towards, towards doing so. Thank you so, so much, James. I'm very interesting um, and curious what more findings you'll, uh, yeah, f what more findings there'll be. Um, and we've already spoken a lot about workplace adjustments and they were mostly concerning hiring processes and autistic adults being in work eventually. Um, so Jade, I was wondering how does this, how do the workplace adjustments for one, but then also uh, more interestingly, disclosure affect career, career progression of uh, individuals who are neurodivergent? Yeah. Um... Yeah, so I'm going to sort of caveat what I'm about to say with the fact that this is a very, very under-researched area. Um, I'm actually in the process at the moment of writing up a scoping review on career progression. And we've managed to identify quite a few studies, but actually none of them specifically set out to look at career progression. So yes, just a caveat to say that we, there, there's a lot that we don't know in this area. I think when it comes to um, disclosure, I think lots of people are concerned that if they disclose their diagnosis, they won't be given the same opportunities. Um, and I mean, thinking about that review that I'm writing up, I know that there was definitely at least one paper in there where people spoke about the fact that actually they hadn't disclosed and they had managed to get further than their peers who had disclosed. So I think that's a real valid concern. I think more broadly, I think recruitment is very likely to play a big role in this. I think the issues that people have when they're entering the workforce continue throughout an employment. And if you're going through the route of trying to get promotions and so on, often they have quite rigorous interview um, processes, often multiple stages, and that can be quite difficult. And so the same issues that we continuously talk about when it comes to um, disadvantaging autistic people in entering the workforce, I think that 
that's also a concern as you move through employment. I also think that, so when it comes to adjustments, a lot of autistic people um, and probably more broadly sort of neurodivergent people turn to self-employment as a way to have autonomy over their own adjustments, particularly if it's not gone so well in a sort of traditional employment setting, being able to know that you, you control the adjustments that you can have, the time that you work, who you work with and what you work on. I think that's helpful. So that completely changes career progression. And in, in that respect, you don't typically have those sort of promotional stages. Um, and so the whole landscape of career progression changes. Um, again, that's something that I think is, is very early in the research, if there is any. Um, and so it's definitely something that I would either like to be part of sort of research or I'd just like to see more research in that area. Um, but yes, I think we need so much more about career progression. I think lots of, rightly, lots of people are concerned about the employment rate but I think there's also something to be said for the fact that everybody deserves to have meaningful employment. I think James sort of spoke this morning about um, underemployment, and I think it's a big issue. And I think we need to sort of start focusing on how we can make sure all neurodivergent people get access to the meaningful employment that they want, that is sort of appropriate for them and suits their needs. Thank you so, so much, Jade. Um, hopefully there will be a study uh, soon, which you will be part of and be able to share those findings soon. Um, so we are already spoke about um, disclosure and workplace adjustments with regards to career progression. So Mary, um, I was wondering how does do disclosure and workplace adjustments affect the mental health of neurodiverse individuals? <laughs> Yeah, that's a big issue for our members in particular, um, because so many autistic doctors are not able to disclose at all. Um, and I think that's certainly reflected in the autistic workforce much more widely. Um, it's really damaging to mental health to not be able to disclose. But at the same time, we have to remember that disclosure is not safe for an awful lot of autistic employees. And, you know, we talk about the numbers of people in employment and we talk about trying to get people into employment, but we really need to provide supports, I think, for autistic people who are already in employment, in the workforce. Um, but that is really complicated by the fact that, you know, the majority can't disclose. And, you know, there is this hidden workforce, really hidden autistic workforce, um, whose needs a lot of the time, a lot of times are just simply not being met. And that's resulting in, really high rates of attrition from the workforce, which is unnecessary. We are really needlessly losing colleagues, you know, and particularly in, in healthcare where the workforce crisis is, you know, is just so, um, so pronounced right across the health services. We really can't afford to be losing people, but so much of it is to do with stigma and the myths and misconceptions and stereotypes around autism. I mean, like I'm currently working on a project with uh, a group of autistic psychiatrists and, you know, I started out looking at uh, disclosure and their disclosure experiences only to realize that none of them were openly autistic at work. Um, and the reason for that is because a lot of it is to do with the myths around empathy, you know, this nonsense that we don't feel empathy, that we, you know, that autistic people have no empathy. That's absolutely not true. But that is probably one of the most pervasive myths around autism um, that we absolutely have to have to address and particularly relevant for the psychiatrist because because it's such a relational specialty. The idea is that, you know, um, people are concerned that their colleagues would feel that, well, you can't be a psychiatrist if you don't have empathy. Um, which is, as we know, nonsense. And it's worth it's worth saying as well that um, in ADI, the biggest group numerically are the GPs, um, but the second most common specialty is psychiatry. And then, of course, when you consider the relevant numbers of GPs and psychiatrists, you know, psychiatrists may be the most overrepresented specialty um, amongst autistic doctors. You know, and there's such a such a, a depth of knowledge around autism that our autistic psychiatrists could be sharing with the wider with, with the wider um profession but because stigma prevents disclosure that knowledge is lost you know and um it's really sad to see it's really sad to see that but i think the other thing that's important to recognize in terms of disclosure and mental health in the workplace is that you know 
good mental health for autistic people um, is, is easily achieved. But we have to address the stigma in society. You know, there's this the, the, the sense that autistic people, the, the association between being autistic and having poor mental health. I mean, that's not inevitable, you know. Um, sure, the rates are really, really high, but they don't have to be. And a lot of the work that I do is very much around focusing on prevention of mental health, particularly for the next generation of autistic people coming behind us. The, the autistic kids growing up now with a positive autistic identity, and um, it's really, really, re really important. And some of the research that hopefully we're about to publish, actually, I met, alluded to it earlier, the rates of mental ill health amongst our members is just shocking. But what's really interesting is that we have found an association between how we viewed, and I've been talking about this for several years, so it's nice to have some data to back it up, how we frame autism, how we view autism has a profound effect on outcome, particularly in terms of mental health. So what we found in our data is an association, um, and it's very, you know, it's preliminary data, it's a small study, but still, it's an association between viewing autism as a disorder and increased suicide attempts. We've also found an association between um, viewing autism as a disorder and a preference for, for person first language. So to me, what that says is that it, it shows the importance of moving towards a neurodiversity affirmative approach to autism, you know, um, where we're, you know, we're not seen as disordered. Can you imagine what it's like growing up? getting the message from your earliest days that we are somehow disordered and broken at our very core. Is it any wonder people end up with poor mental health? So I think we absolutely have to recognize the value in neurodiversity, the value in diversity itself, the, the strengths that autistic people bring, you know, and move away from that core deficit model um, that, tell, you know, tells people that they're broken. Um, and that's when I think we'll see a lot. We're, we're not going to see the same rates of poor mental health, I think, in the, you know, the generation of autistic kids that grow up in that neurodiversity affirmative paradigm. At least I hope not. Thank you so, so much for sharing um, your findings. And I hope uh, you'll be right um, that, that it will change in the future. Um, so one more interesting topic before we move over to the Q&A would be um, that I would like to understand what the role and importance of policies and procedures um, regarding your diversity in the workplace is. Um, would you be able to share some of info on that, Angela? Hi, Annie, definitely. Sorry, I don't know why I turned my camera off and then it shot back off then. I think with regards to the role of policy and procedure, there's a, a huge role there for kind of reducing um, I made some notes, I'm just going to get them up on my computer side and look at it earlier. But I think whilst kind of the awareness is growing, I think only 10% of employers roughly know, um, are actually known to address neurodiversity in their policy and procedures. So I think there's an importance here with actually introducing a policy and policy with regards to relating to a neurodiversity type policy then. I think there's advantages of putting it in as kind of a well understood framework for management to use. Um, I think there's a huge role for kind of creating a culture free from discrimination by having policies which outline kind of procedure with um, neurodivergent employees um, and in kind of creating a supportive culture. Sorry, I'm also kind of looking at some of the questions that were coming up and I wanted to go back to the chat because I was noticing quite a few things that were coming up with regards to adjustments. And I think this is where if we could implement um, policies which actually explored reasonable adjustments, because I noticed a lot of people were saying that it's sometimes quite challenging to actually address what accommodations could I be looking for, what could I be asking for when it comes to working, and I think that is the biggest challenge that a lot of people face after a diagnosis, kind of going, well, what would work be able to offer me, what, what would they be able to do to support me, so actually by creating policies, there is a huge area there for us to actually be making sure that we're looking at reasonable adjustments and looking at everyone as an individual and making sure that we can make those specific recommendations and um, adjustments to make the work-life balance as easy as possible and making sure that we're getting the most out of people in the environment where they're most comfortable. Um, so I think that's where kind of policy is. It's also a place where we can like implement non-stigmatized language um, and really kind of, again, increase awareness with regards to neurodivergence. 
Thank you so, so, so much, Angarat, for sharing that. Um, so I would like to move over to the Q&A. Um, so some of you have asked questions. So the first question is from Ruth, and I think that's mostly thank you for Mari. Um, any tips or suggestions to increase awareness slash acceptance of neurodiversity for those working in CAMHS settings? Uh, since it's a very traditional uh, medical model. I'm sorry, I have to be honest and say I zoned out a little bit at the beginning of that question. Would you oh, mind? It's really, no, for off at all. So any tips or suggestions to increase awareness slash acceptance of neurodiversity for those working in the in CAMHS settings? Okay, so that's child and adolescent mental health services that um, or community mental health, uh, I, I suppose the similar answer for both. I think the most important thing really is to recognize that lots of your colleagues are autistic or neurodivergent. Um, and once we get to a point where that's, you know, where it's where it's totally fine to be, you know, to be openly autistic um, in a, you know, CAMS or community mental health team, um, and have our expertise valued. Um, I think that's when we'll really be at a point where, um, you know, we are genuinely tackling the stigma. And the thing is what the autistic psychiatrist, like it, the project that I'm doing currently, it's a doctoral project. Um, and I'm looking at the experiences and insights of a group of eight autistic psychiatrists and half of them work in, um, in child and adolescent mental health. And what they're telling me is that, um the, the the insight that they have and the rapport that they can develop with their with, with their their patients very very quickly um is really different to their non-autistic um neurotypical neurotypical colleagues and what a lot of them tell me is that even though they're not openly um disclosed at work they commonly find that neuro neurodivergent kids who come into the service just get referred to them because it's 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 recognized by their colleagues that they're able to develop a rapport quickly you know get good results with these kids um and yet they have to do it from a place where they're either presenting as maybe parents of neurodivergent or autistic kids, you know, or just not 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 disclosing, you know, at all. And I just think that's such a shame because we're losing um, we're losing all this expertise uh, that could really help. So I think I think recognizing that lots of people and I, I see the same thing in autism research where a lot of people in the area of autism are drawn to this field because of a personal, you know, a personal connection, whether that is, is autist, being autistic or neurodivergent themselves, or they have a family interest or, you know, whatever. But lots of people um, are in this sort of autism world because they're autistic. Not, not everybody recognizes it. So I think the most important thing is that everybody working in autism services or neurodiver neurodivergent services should consider their own positionality carefully um, and know for sure whether or not they're autistic. Because the thing is, if you are autistic as a psychiatrist and you don't realize that you're autistic, then people will come to you and will describe experiences and traits and features of, of life that you will discount as not being autistic because you share those experiences. Um, and that's a real shame. And the autistic psychiatrists tell me that they they just have this sense of guilt really or, or over the patients that they've all missed before they realize that they were autistic. So I think considering your own positionality is very important. Thank you so, so much, Mary. Um, so the next question I'll be asking openly, um, which is from Irene. Um, and she is wondering whether there's a real major co-occurrence between the LGBTQ plus um, and neurodiversity community, meaning that from her experience, 95% of the people that are from the LGBTQ plus community are also neurodivergent. Um, and she was wondering whether there are any specific resources um, for people who are struggling both ends really, um, because she also is afraid that having or sharing both or disclosing both would mean that it's just a, like a trend really rather than being taken seriously. Um, so would anyone um, go ahead? And... 
this isn't a specific area of focus focus for us, but I think there's pretty good research which shows that um, maybe the numbers aren't quite as high as is, is, is been reported in, in the question, but there's an increased likelihood of um, autistic people um, identifying as being uh, part of the, the LGBTQ community. Uh, in terms of resources, I think there are resources out there, but I, I, I can point specifically um, I can point specifically to it, but I know that there's been a number of pieces of pieces of work. But just from a research perspective, in terms of of of, of, of the prevalence, sort of the co-occurrence, um, yeah, it's right to sort of point that out. Thank you so much, James. Um, so another question would be from Fiona: um, What is your experience of workplace? The workplace is accepting self-diagnosis to provide adjustments or an acknowledgement that the person is uh, waiting for an assessment. In that sense, since a, the waiting list is very long, um, and although most uh, adjustments don't do not come at a cost, um, that fact is not commonly known. Um, so, would anyone have some? Yeah, would need to share their experience. I'm happy to sort of answer this. Um, in terms of workplaces accepting self-diagnosis, and if anybody sort of has better information than me, then please do correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that you shouldn't have to disclose a diagnosis or provide a diagnosis to access reasonable adjustments, which is the legal kind of um, adjustments. I think there's a lot of confusion in terms of what's considered reasonable and the sort of legality around that I think can be quite confusing um, but you shouldn't have to in theory provide a diagnosis um, and I do know of a lot of organisations um, that are happy for people to sort of explain that they're on a waiting list and that they think they might be autistic or might and being ADHD yeah. um, as a sort of way of saying these are the kinds of adjustments I think I might need um, but yes I think in practice a lot of organizations probably do want that and I think um, it, it's a difficult one I think if, if this is sort of a situation for you I think trying and just sort of saying you know there's financial barriers in the way I, there's a long waiting list right now I can't give this um, I, I think that's all you can do. Um, I just wanted to add to this, if that's okay. I completely agree. So okay. James right with that. There's no okay. kind of legality around actually sharing the diagnosis. I mean, we definitely have it when clients come through a diagnostic process with us in that in-between phase of getting the diagnosis and wanting to tell work they're looking for reasonable adjustments to be made. And on occasions, what we do is we tend to provide a letter to the company just to say, actually, yeah, we can confirm they're going through a diagnostic process. The diagnosis isn't necessarily confirmed yet, but actually reasonable adjustments may may still be useful what I'd also say though is we've actually had it in times where people have come to us for a diagnosis and they've not received the diagnosis however there is still the need there for reasonable adjustments so regardless of whether there is actually a diagnosis there's no need there's no reason why people can still be asking for reasonable adjustments to be made when um, kind of thinking about their working environment as I mentioned earlier, I'm definitely someone who prefers working remotely from home. I get I definitely achieve a lot more in day to day. And that's just because I get so easily distracted by things. And that's just an adjustment that my work uh, employ, employer have been willing to make for me. Now, this is very similar with regards to school as well. I know obviously we're thinking about work, but just for people who do have um, in, like with children who are going through school, there is still a, a potential there that you can still be asking for adjustments to be made. Yes, it's a little bit more complicated with regards to when you need to provide the diagnosis, but you can still be asking for those reasonable adjustments to be made, um, regardless if they're if you have received the diagnosis or not. Thank you so, so much, Angara. Um, and that the next question also kind of leans into the whole workplace adjustment. Um, so Gregory. I uh, would love to know if anyone has any insights um, about autistic or neurodivergent individuals ha not having 
that much insight in their own strength uh, and challenges for since their diagnosis so it even and that is the same experience my personal experience uh, it is a journey um and it's mostly discovered by doing so he's wondering if anyone has insights on employers who have given that support during that journey really yeah i'm happy to talk to, talk to this uh, so one of the things that we've definitely heard through conducting popcorn reviews is a real challenge with the onus to put on the autistic or neurodivergent person to disclose um, their own reasonable adjustments. And, you know, although many of us here are very knowledgeable and fluent in terms of the sorts of types of reasonable adjustments that you can make, a number of people just aren't really. And there's a huge onus put on the person to try and understand and articulate what they are. But like all human beings, neurodivergent or not, actually having insight into the sort of support that you need is actually extremely difficult. And um, I think having a more structured process is something that we definitely need to get better at moving towards. So, you know, I think some of the research that we've done with Jane looking at um, the sort of types of reasonable adjustments that people can request is helpful. Now, I think then beginning to put that into a structure where we're asking everyone, neurodivergent or not, around the types of reasonable adjustments that they could have and, and, and might require in order to enable their best to be to be their to be their best version of themselves and to secure their well-being, I think is really, really something that we need to work on as a next step. And I know that these things like reasonable adjustment with passports are a step in that direction, but I think there's still um, um, more to do. Thank you so so much, James. Um, so I'll group the next two questions a bit together. Um, so someone is asking whether there are any training resources um, to educate NHS workplaces um, and whether there's a similar doctor's network for people with ADHD. Um, and then whether there are tips or suggestions to find uh, mental health care providers who work with neurodivergent individuals um, or any research areas uh, as an uh, autistic and ADHD psychology student? Um, yeah, I'll come in on this one. There are a couple of groups actually for um, for doctors, for neurodivergent doctors. There's a, co there's a couple of different ones on Facebook. Um, anybody wants, I, I, I'll get the link and I'll pop that into the chat at some point. Um, but in terms of training, um, there is a huge amount happening in the last year or two, which is really, really exciting, um, particularly in the UK. Um, so I'm involved with a couple of different things, um, in particular, um, the National, uh, the Royal College of Psychiatrists, um, I think is probably the most exciting program, I think, at the moment that I'm really, that I'm involved in. Um, it's just super. The College of Psychiatrists have developed a national autism training program for their own members, for psychiatrists. And it's it's delivered at two levels as a foundation level and an enhanced level. Um, and I've been involved with both where I've presented the autistic space framework. And I think it's so exciting that it's happening um, with the psychiatrist because that will then filter out into the community mental health services, into CAMS, into, uh, you know, into uh, mental health support much more widely. But I think What's also exciting is that a lot of the other rural colleges are getting interested and getting involved. And a lot of the work that we've done has been around promoting um, awareness of neuro uh, neurodivergent and autistic colleagues. But that is also allowing um, increased recognition of the needs of autistic people using those services. Um, so I think that's why that, that's very interesting. Um, so the uh, yeah, I've I've had I've done training for lots of different colleges, lots of different trusts, lots of different um bodies, you know, medical bodies in the UK, and we're starting some work here in Ireland uh on, on the same on the same path, which I think is really exciting as well. So yeah, there is lots happening. It will take a while before it all filters down to you know every GP surgery department. Um, but I think the changes are really positive. Thank you so, so, so much, Mary, for sharing. Um, we um, encouraging as well. Um, so we would then close off this session um, and have everyone enjoy their lunch break. Um, thank you so, so much for joining this panel for uh, of today. Um, thank you so, so much to all the panelists. So thank you much, Angara, James, 
Um, Larry and Jade for being here today um, and sharing your experiences, your insights. Um, so the lunch breaks is going to start now and then you uh, it will start back again at 1.30 p.m. So thanks so much, everyone, um, for joining today um, and continue to enjoy the rest of the sessions.